Washington is not listening to the voice of small business. That's what my next guest says, and he is the voice of small business. The president and CEO of the National Federation of Independent Business, Dan Danner, joins us here on set. Mr. Danner, welcome to Bottom Line. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. What is Washington not hearing? Well, they're not hearing about the great uncertainty that small businesses feel out there today. The reason they're not hiring is they're very concerned about the future of the government going forward. They're concerned about the cost of health care. They're concerned about the deficit and the debt. And they think with this environment, it's not a good time for them to invest and create jobs. Is this just, is, is it the psychology that's permeating this right now? Is it just, as you say, uncertainty? Or, it, unfortunately, you have to bring it up, is it more political than anything else? Well, I think the two of those are very related. I mean, if you're a small business owner and you don't know what the cost of your health care is going to be going forward, that's a great risk. They're very concerned about what the government regulators are doing to them and their business. They're very concerned when they see things like the NLRB decision for Boeing that says you don't have the right to locate a plant wherever you want to. That scares them. We'll get to health care in a minute, but I wanted to, to ask you about something because I was doing some research on this. Uh, this week was the 10-year uh, anniversary of the Bush tax cuts, and you say that uh, making those tax cuts permanent would be one thing that Washington, Washington could do to help small business. Uh, Mother Jones cited statistics from the Economic Policy Institute in the report this week. Between 2001 and 2010, the Bush tax cuts added $2.6 trillion to the public debt. Fifty percent of the total debt accrued during that time. And over the past 10 years, the country has spent more than $400 billion just servicing the debt created by the budget cuts, tax collections, plunging to their lowest share of the economy in 60 years. How is that helpful to Main Street? Well, what is helpful to Main Street is that 52% of all people that have a job today work for a so-called pass-through entity which means whether they're a subchapter S or an LLC or an individual partnership, they pay taxes at the individual rate. So when you're talking about increasing the top rate, you're increasing it on people who are the job creators. Okay. And for a lot of them, that's not take home. That's the money they have to invest in their business and create jobs. So increasing the top rate will hurt job creation and many small businesses who create those jobs. Then what's the solution? Well, I think the solution, one of the solutions is certainly some stability. Uh, send some signal today that you're not going to increase taxes on the job creators if you want them to create more jobs and, frankly, get the regulators to cease and desist and, and stay uh, off the backs of small business for a while. We were talking about health care. You are joining with some of the 26 states who are yeah. deciding that they, they would like this law, frankly, to go away. And now it's before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. You filed a brief, and you believe that one of the problems here is that it's in violation of the Commerce Clause. How so? Well, we believe the individual mandate is, is the part that's in violation of the Commerce, commerce Clause, is unconstitutional, that the government does not have the right, should not have the right, to tell you as an individual that you have to purchase something just because you exist. Now, the, the, the flip side of the argument, as I'm sure you've heard, is that if everyone is required to get health insurance, then it helps those who don't. If you don't have health insurance, but I do, and you get sick, I'm basically ending up paying for it. What about an individual responsibility mandate? Should you not have health insurance so I don't have to pay for it? Whatever you do has to be constitutional. And if the Constitution says that uh, it, it's wrong to, for the government to demand you to pay for health care or something else, and the question would be, when does it stop? So if the government, can the government mandate that you join a health club? That's good for your health, and that's good to, to keep you healthy. The government says you have to have a driver's license. Uh, but, but it does not require you to purchase a car. True. So, so the government is not saying that uh, if you purchase a car and you want to drive it on the roads, it's very different from the government saying you have to purchase health care. At this point, all of the stories that we see about the economy, about the jobless rate, unemployment still at 9.1 percent, and we've heard for the last couple of years a lot of folks in Washington, uh, Chamber, of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce leading the charge, saying that President Obama has been anti-business. Do you agree with that sentiment? I, I think you get very mixed signals 
uh, at times from what comes out of the White House and frankly what comes out of some of the agencies. As I mentioned earlier, the President has said we want to reduce the amount of regulations on business. At the same time, you have decisions coming out of the NLRB and other places that look very, very punitive to business. What concerns so, you the most? W about those individual regulations? Yeah, but I you, think you they, mentioned the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board. What concerns you the most? What do you think is the most punitive? Well, I certainly think the Boeing uh, case okay. is very punitive. To, to, to say to a business that has increased their employment in the state of Washington, not reduced it, increased it, they don't have the right, shouldn't have the right to open a new plant wherever they think the economic environment is best. I think that's a pretty chilling decision. What are the small business owners, the men and women in this country, the entrepreneurs, what are they telling you needs to be done? When, when you talk to them, when you sit down to these groups, what's the one thing they say could unleash a torrent of economic activity and that includes hiring and perhaps paying people better wages? Well again, I think it's mostly, it, it didn't, it's mostly certainty. I, I'm, if I'm going to make an investment, an investment's about risk, and I want to be able to calculate the potential return on my investment. But even in so, certain times, an investment like that is risky, is it not? Sure, but, but, but you calculate risk. And, and most of the small businesses we talk to believe today that the economy is going to get worse before it gets better. Do you believe that? Uh, I, I do. I think that's where we are right today. I mean, we hope that turns around. And our, and our small business owners hope that turns around. But certainly there aren't good signals on the horizon today for the, for the weeks and months ahead. Dan Danner is the head of the NFIB, gracious enough to come into our studio on a really hot day <laughs> here in New York City. Mr. Danner, Thanks it's for a having pleasure. Me. Thanks. Please come back yeah. because this is a conversation Love we're going to gonna have even after the gang of six, even I after have. the debt ceiling. Oh, even before I let you go. The, I, I have to ask you quickly, debt ceiling argument, how's that going to get resolved and what impact does that have on small business? I, I wish I knew how it was going to get resolved. I don't think uh, anyone there knows yet how it's going to get resolved. I think we certainly hope it does because if we don't, um, I think this is going to have a big impact on all business going forward. A chilling impact because a it regards impact. the full faith and credit of the United chilling States? Impact. No question. All right, Mr. Danner, thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you. your time today.